So now that you have a conceptual understanding of how memory corruption and buffer overflows work, let's look at some of the tools and techniques you can use to kind of more quickly exploit these types of vulnerabilities. So the kind of first and most naive approach that you can use, and it's honestly a reoccurring meme every time that we, we kind of talk about this topic, it would be to just throw some bytes into the program and see what happens. You could do that on the terminal, doing something like what we see here down at the bottom, echo a, right, into, into the binary. Now, we're going to do that. Uh, and for everything in this video, we're going to have one example binary that we're going to kind of play around with. Let's run through how this binary behaves right now. Uh, we'll note that there is a win function that just says you win. This win function is never called in the binary. This isn't, uh, doesn't seem very useful, uh, but at the end of the lecture, this will become relevant. And now, now we take a look at main, which is gonna be the entry point for the program. It doesn't do anything too exciting. It says it's about to call a function. It calls the function and then it prints out that it's about to return. So main is not very interesting. Now I also declare a struct. Uh, this is a struct uh, type named my struct. It has three members. The first member is a username. Uh, it's called username. It is a character array of length 64. So it's just this buffer where I can store some bytes. Uh, I imagine some type of username. The second member uh, is named always false, which is a strange name uh, for a, a member or for a variable, uh, but we'll see why in a moment. Uh, lastly, we have this buffer called other data. It's a character buffer of size 128. So the meat and potatoes of this um, binary is this function that's called vulnerable function. Uh, vulnerable function uh, first declares a struct named s that is of the type my struct. It then sets that always false value to be zero. Uh, for those that are unaware, in the C programming language, zero is a falsy value, and any non-zero value is a true or a truthy value. So if something that is zero would be considered false. Uh, if we just kind of skim through this vulnerable function right now, we see that always false is set to zero and then it is not changed again. So it should always be false, hence the name. Uh, next, the vulnerable function will ask, what is your name? It will call read. And so we will read from standard in to this username buffer. And this is the kind of first and most obvious vulnerability or bug uh, that exists in this program. Uh, we can read to this username buffer up to 300 bytes. But how large is this username buffer? It's 64 bytes. So if the user were to pass in more than 64 bytes, we would suddenly be writing uh, over memory that we certainly didn't intend to in this program. So after that read call occurs, the program is going to print F uh, hello, and then whatever the user entered. Hopefully it was in fact their name. And then before vulnerable function returns, it's going to either print out always false is false or always false is true, uh, depending upon the value of always false. Uh, since it is always false, we set it to zero and zero is falsy. We would expect the program to always print out always false is false. So now if we do what is on the slides there and we echo some number of A's uh, into uh, this program, uh, we're just gonna echo A and then send that into uh, via a pipe into A dot out. Uh, we see hello, A, 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 and then a new line character, then the exclamation point. So the new line character is, we see our first kind of like bug here. The new line character is not indicating the end of the user's input. Because if we take a look at the source again, we are using read to take in user input. And read has no idea that we're trying to read a string. Read just takes in arbitrary bytes. And so what's happening here is all of my A's, including my new line character, uh, get passed to the program. So then when it prints it with the exclamation point, the new line character is part of that display. And there's in fact more issues with not 
using the proper um, function call to take in input in do IO. If I send in enough bytes and we run this a few times, what we should see, there we go, we're starting to get some strange behavior here. Uh, if we look right here, there's this like weird quote mark and all of a sudden there's a Z space. Uh, over here, I have an extra new line. What, what's ha what is going on? Why is this program looking really weird now? Well, the answer is something that I kind of alluded to already. C strings in C need to be null terminated. And read is not going to put that terminating null byte at the end for us. And so when we print this string, uh, we print a string starting at username, what happens is every byte that is, we keep displaying bytes until a null byte is encountered. But since read doesn't put a null byte there, we, if the byte that is after my enter, after my new line, isn't a null byte, it will just get displayed to the screen. And what the value of these like unknown unset bytes are is completely random. It's just whatever it happens to be in memory. And we see that this, this just changes periodically. Like sometimes it'll be the same. Other times it'll be something completely different because that's just whatever those bytes happen to be. Happen to be. And that, that will be true. It'll continue to print out arbitrary bytes until a null byte is encountered. And so that is the, the second kind of bug or vulnerability that's in there because now we're leaking additional data, right? We're leaking something about the internal state of memory by printing a string that is not null terminated. But what we're actually interested in here uh, is trying to get the program to behave differently. Now, the, the kind of straightforward way of doing it is, well, let's try and make this say always false is true. Now, I've been using Bash, but we're civilized people. We're going to use Python uh, to kind of carry, carry the day forward uh, from this moment. And so we're going to start off with some boilerplate that we've probably already seen uh, from Pwn import star context arch equals AMD64. And now what I want to do is I want to create a process uh, that's going to run this uh, binary. So P equals process A dot out. And then I want to send my payload. So we're going to P send. No, I don't have to uh, give it a whole bunch of A's in one giant string. Instead, I can say I want to send the byte that is the character A, and I want to send 65 of them. Uh, and then we will and wrap up our script here with P interactive. And now I'm kind of cheating here because I know this buffer is 64 bytes in size since we looked at the source, but you can imagine that we just kind of guessed on this number. We just guessed big numbers, small numbers. And now all of a sudden we see always false is true. Well, what happened? Well, we wrote 65 A's starting at this username uh, buffer. And once we wrote our 65th character, it overflowed into this always false integer. And so the value of always false became a, whatever the, the hexadecimal value of a is. And that is a truthy value. So all of a sudden this check here was true and we see always false is true. And so we, we oftentimes can find uh, buffer overflows and memory corruption bugs by just throwing a whole bunch of bytes into something and seeing if the behavior changes. Another way that we can kind of reason about uh, memory corruption, if we want to be a little more precise in what we're doing instead of just throwing a bunch of bytes into something, is we can analyze this binary statically. Now, one way that we can analyze a binary statically is using a decompiler. So using something like Ida, Ghidra, Binary Ninja, Anger Management, uh, any one of these tools. But we're going to try and do something a bit more precise and come up with that same 64 uh, byte number. And now the strategy here using any type of tool is to identify two key points. 
We want to identify where does our user input start, right? Where, where, where does our input that we pass into the program start? And then the second thing we want to find is where is the thing that we're trying to clobber, the thing that we're trying to overwrite or corrupt. Once we've found those two memory locations, we can just subtract and we'll find that distance. So let's do that here with Ida. I'm going to open up Ida. We will open our example binary A dot out. Uh, once we are here, I'm going to hit the tab button. That's going to decompile the binary and show me kind of a pseudo C like syntax. And this looks very similar to the source code. And then I go into vulnerable function. Well, this doesn't quite look like my source code. And that's because decompilation is not a perfect um, act. There's information that's lost going down to a binary, and these type of tools make a best effort to try and represent what the actual source code is. Now, my once I'm here, what are the two points of interest that I want to check out? Where do my bytes go? And then where is the thing I'm trying to clobber? Well, the bytes are read in via this call to read, and they're going to go into, Ida thinks it's just buff, and it's a 64 byte character buffer. If we click on buff, uh, we see that it highlights every instance where that is used. And we see that up here at the top of vulnerable function, uh, the character buffer is located at RSP plus zero or RBP minus D zero. These are two different ways of referencing the exact same location. One is going from the bottom of the, bottom of the stack uh, up, and the other one is going from the frame pointer down. Now, so that is where my input is starting to be written, is it's at RSP plus zero. The other thing I want to find is the value that I'm trying to corrupt or overwrite. Well, I'm trying to change this conditional branch, which is a check on V2. If I click on V2, we see all of the locations it's used and it's highlighted. And we look up here at the top, it is located at RSP plus hex. 40. If I subtract those two values, it's going to be no surprise that hex 40 minus 0 is in fact hex 40, and hex 40 is 64. Again, we found that distance from these two locations, and we've arrived at the same number. That's a good sign, because uh, it means we did it right. Now, IDA and decompilers are not the only type of static analysis tool. Uh, we could even use, for instance, object dump uh, on the uh, binary here to get the uh, assembly itself. I don't want to see that. I want it to be in Intel syntax. And we could go and find that vulnerable function and look at it, uh, look at the raw assembly. But this is all black and white. It's a little bit hard to do. My personal preference, even if I'm just doing static analysis, is of course to use my favorite tool, GDB. Now I'm not gonna run the binary. If I ran the binary, it would be dynamic analysis. Static analysis means we are analyzing the binary while not running it. And so I'm just going to use GDB to show me the disassembly of that vulnerable function. And now it's at least colored, it's pretty, it's easy on the eyes. GDB is just great. Now we're still gonna use that same strategy here. I need to identify two locations. Where, do, where does my input start? Uh, and then where's the location of the thing that I'm trying to uh, corrupt? Well, I know my input is getting um, taken in by this read call and I need to know, well, what register am I interested in? If you're not familiar, we can consult the man page for read, and we see the first argument is FD is the file descriptor. The second argument is the pointer to the memory location where these bytes are going to go. Now, hopefully at this point, uh, you're starting to memorize the argument order uh, for function calls. Uh, it's going to go something like RDI, RSI, RDX, etc. The, I'm interested in the second argument, which is going to be an RSI. So I'm going to start right here at this read call and start looking up. And what I'm looking for is what is the value of RSI? 
and we see right here RSI is whatever RAX is. But I, that, that's useful, but it doesn't help me know the, the location in memory. So I have to keep reading up. Now right here, I see that RAX is set to a location in memory. We see LEA RAX RBP minus hex D zero. LEA is a load effective address, and we can think of it as moving this address that's shown right here into RAX. And so now I have found that the location that I begin uh, writing my input to, right, our input location is RBP minus, uh, where was it, hex D zero. The other thing I want to find is my um, corruption target, right? Uh, where, where, where am I trying to go? Now that can be a little bit harder to identify looking at uh, just the these assembly instructions, but uh, the kind of rhyme and reason here is I'm looking for two things. I'm looking for where is a like test instruction or a comparison instruction, something that is doing some type of check, and then shortly after that will be a conditional jump. This could be a jump less than a jump. Uh, greater than a jump equals uh, anything like that and right here this kind of jumps out to me we see a test of the value of eax and then a conditional jump so in one instance we'll jump to 4011e7 which is right here and this is where we're loading a value into edi and calling puts and if we take the other branch, then we would just continue forward. We move a different value into EDI and call puts. Uh, this is very similar to what we saw in the source. And in fact, this conditional if else uh, compiles down to these instructions right here. We're checking if it's zero. If it is, we go one way. If it isn't, we go the other way. So if it's zero, we jump down here and we're printing out the string that's located at this right here at 402088, which we see always false is false. And then if it's not zero, uh, then we will act, uh, print the other string, always false is true. And so the location I'm interested at is right here, which is whatever is in EAX. If I look up, well, the value of EAX is whatever is in memory at RBP minus hex 90. So that means my corruption location here is RBP minus hex 90. Now, if I were to subtract these two from each other, uh, what I would get, we can do it here in GDB, uh, we can print uh, hex D0 minus hex 90, we get hex 40, and then if I want it to be displayed in decimal, uh, we say P slash D, and we get that 64. It's the same number I've encountered already, but I dealt with this statically, because I didn't run the binary. Now, the next way that we could try and figure this out is using dynamic analysis. Now, personally, this is my preference. I really like um, messing around with running programs because then if something doesn't act like, doesn't behave how I, how I expected, I can use the debugger to ask questions and reason about what's going on in memory. Our strategy is still pretty much the exact same thing. We want to identify where the input goes. We want to identify the location of the thing we're trying to corrupt. Now I could do this in GDB directly, uh, but we've already been using Python. So let's use Python uh, here. So we're going to change our P equals process to P equals GDB debug. And we will script this a little bit. So the second argument to GDB debug is a can be commands that you want to run in GDB. So one thing that I may want to do is I want to break it read. And let's send let's send uh, 64 64 A's in here. 
Now, I still broke at underscore start. By default, I, Pwn Tools, when we run GDB in this banner, is always going to break at start. I really don't want that to happen, though. I want to just go straight to when read is being called. And I can do that by setting the breakpoint at read and then continuing onward. If I do that in my Python script, we see suddenly, all right, I'm at the beginning of read. If we look at this trace here, main called vulnerable function, vulnerable function called read. All right, that's great stuff. What am I interested in? Well, we already saw from the man pages that the second argument to read is going to be stored in RSI. So I can just print RSI. Well, that's going to be the location where these bytes are getting read into. If I type finny for finish, I'm going to run all of read and then automatically break at the next thing, whoever called read, which was vulnerable function. So we can see right here, I'm now right after read. You could also look at RSI at this point in execution and we get that same value. Now, if you don't believe me, or you're not sure that that's the, the correct address you want to look at, we can use GDB to verify what we're thinking. Or we can examine the string that is at RSI. And we see that there are, in fact, 64 A's here. And so I know I have the right address. Now, another nice thing about using dynamic analysis here is, well, maybe I want to get like a bigger picture of things. The Jeff gives me this nice kind of stack printout, but what if I want to see it in another way? Well, I could say in GDB here, examine, say, 20 giant hex at RSP. And so now I'm just dumping out kind of the, the memory of what is going on on the stack. And so that can be very useful. Now, I still want to need to find... I, so far, I found RSI, which was the location where my input starts uh, being written. The other thing that I'm interested in is where um, is the value that I'm trying to corrupt or overwrite. Now, for that, I would suggest doing kind of what we already did here, where we disassemble the function and we take a look. We already saw that it's located at RBP minus hex 90. But since I'm running the program, I can use GDB. And this is only relevant because I am in this function right now. Because my breakpoint is inside the vulnerable function, RBP is set up at runtime right now. Everything is like we're really running. But I can make this RBP minus hex 90, this kind of abstract thing, become a very real address. And so this is the address of the thing that I want to corrupt. If I take these two values and I subtract them, let's see here, we'll take this one and we will subtract the other one. We get hex 40, uh, which we already saw is 64. And so we can do our math, uh, except now we're doing it with real numbers of a process running, real memory addresses. I really like that. And that informs us in our Python script that if we wanted to corrupt it, the answer would be 65. We can continue on. And we see always false is true up here uh, in the other pane outside of GDB. And so dynamic analysis is a great way to kind of reason about what's going on with memory corruption. Now, the last kind of tool or technique I'm going to mention when we're thinking about memory corruption is something that's called a cyclic value. This isn't a different way of thinking about it. It's just another tool in your tool belt you can use uh, in certain scenarios. So what is a cyclic value? Well, a cyclic value uh, can be generated on the command line on the dojo by typing cyclic followed by the length of the string that you want. So here's cyclic 16. Uh, we see a string that's A, 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 B, A, 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 C, A, 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 D, A, 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 right? And this pattern can continue onward. 
Now, it's kind of a strange pattern to have. What The reason that we like this pattern, we like cyclic values, is by default, taking any substring of four characters is enough to uniquely identify the location in the substring. So I could generate this cyclic uh, 16, 16 character cyclic value. And then on the command line, I could type cyclic dash L for lookup. And I can look up where in, where in this is A, A, B, A, and it returns two. And if we look at that, we have A, A, then A, A, B, A. The answer is two. There's two bytes before my search query. Now, this is how you do it in the terminal. But as civilized people, we certainly like Python. And so you can do the same thing over here in Python, uh, where we're calling cyclic after we've imported pwn tools. And then to do the lookup, uh, Pwn Tools exposes this cyclic underscore find. Now, I'm going to use a cyclic value to uh, kind of unveil a third bug that exists in this binary that we haven't, we haven't hit yet. So instead of passing in a whole bunch of A's, I'm going to use a cyclic value. And I'm going to use a 300 character cyclic value just you know, something that's that's large. And if we were to run this, and I'm not even going to set a breakpoint, we're just going to run it and continue. What happens here is GDB tells us that the program crashed, and it crashed because it seg faulted. Well, I sent in a giant, you know, a huge number of bytes. And in these bytes, uh, overflowed not only uh, past the user uh, username character buffer, but we flowed past the always false value, and we even flowed past uh, that third character array. Array, uh, if we take a look here, uh, that was other data. We overwrote all of that stuff. We overwrote all the way to data that determines what happens when the function returns, because we seg faulted on ret. Now, if you recall how calling a function works in x86, there's two kind of important values that are stored on the stack that help clean up the stack and determine where we jump to. If I type info frame in GDB, this will tell me where these values are located. Now, since I'm doing dynamic analysis, I should be able to examine, say, 30 giant hex at RSP. And we see here that RBP is at CBE, the saved RBP is at CBE0. Now, uh, where is that? Oh, so that has already been popped off the stack. Uh, let's look a little bit. Uh, behind there. So I'm looking for CBE0, uh, D8, CBE0 is located right here, and this is going to be part of my cyclic value. If I were to examine the string that is located at my saved RBP, hey, that, that looks very much like a cyclic value. And so we've managed to corrupt the, uh, the saved RBP. But that's not particularly interesting. What is interesting is overwriting the saved return address, because whatever this value is, is what will determine where control flow goes in this binary at the end of vulnerable function. Because we remember that ret is functionally the same thing as if we could write the instruction pop RIP. It takes whatever is at the top of the stack and it throws it into the instruction pointer. And the reason that we seg faulted is because if we were to examine the giant hex that is at RSP, it is this right here. This is not a valid memory address. We've corrupted it. So how does a cyclic value help me like turn this into an exploit and, and figure out what's going on. Well, I can copy these four bytes right here that are at RSP 
at the time of rat. We see E-A-A-C. We're going to hang on to that. E-A-A-C. I said we can type cyclic find. E-A-A-C. I get 216. By using a cyclic value, I now know there's 216 bytes before that saved return address. So now, let's send 216 A's. And, and then inspect what's going on. I'll have that breakpoint at read now. So now we are inside read. If I finny, let's examine 40 giant hex at RSP. Let's info frame. Uh, we see that the saved return address is at 79E8. That's going to be this location right here. And we see all of my A's filled all of the memory up until this saved return address. And if we were to inspect it, examine the address at that location, we see that this hasn't been overwritten yet, right? It normally is this location in main. And if we want to look at some of the instructions that happen there, uh, we could examine, for instance, 20 instructions at that address. And what we see is it's going to load a value, it's going to call puts, and then main is going to return. That makes sense if we map that over to our source code. What happens in main after a vulnerable function is called? We print out about to return from main and then we're done. So this is the assembly that corresponds to what happens after the vulnerable function uh, returns. Well, what if I don't want to return back to main? What if I want to corrupt this return pointer and do something that the binary had no intention of doing whatsoever? Well, let's use GDB and let's print the address of win. We see that win is 401146. Let's remember that. Four zero one uh, one four six. So what I'm doing now is I have one byte, two byte, three byte. There's four bytes. I want to pack this number into sixty-four. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, sixty-four bits. I want to make a sixty-four bit number because we're working uh, in a sixty-four bit architecture. And so we're going to take that number. We write everything up until that saved return address. And then we're, instead of it being the address of main, I'm going to overwrite it with the address of win. So now we're still here in read. And if we uh, finny, so we get out of read, we can say info frame. I want to get the address of that saved uh, return address. And if we examine the address that is located there, it is now pointing to that win function that was never called in this binary. And if I were to continue running, we see that the program returns from vulnerable function from right here in my source. And it suddenly, instead of going back up to main, it jumps and starts executing this win function. And we see you win. So we use a cyclic value to find the location of something that we could clobber and then very easily identify what was the distance to get there. And we used it to overwrite a saved return address in direct control flow somewhere else. Now, this binary, if we run check sec, uh, we'll see that there's several things uh, that are security uh, mechanisms that are not enabled on it. So this binary does not have a canary, and this binary is not uh, has no PIE. And that what uh, those two things are uh, will be discussed in another lecture video, although they I believe they are mentioned uh, in the conceptual content. 
Uh, but we will explore what those are in a later video. Uh, but that's worth noting uh, that you can't just throw in a cyclic value uh, on modern binaries uh, and do what I just described. There's some other mitigations uh, that will make that more difficult. So cyclic values can be used to quickly find an offset. Uh, we take a large cyclic value, we pass it into the program, we identify what characters are located in the thing that we're trying to corrupt, we can look up the offset or distance to it. Combining it with GDB, as I just did, is extremely powerful. Now, this was all kind of straightforward buffer overflows on the stack. Everything in this, uh, in this example, we are on the stack. Everything was like a contiguous region of memory. Memory corruption as a whole absolutely consists of more complicated scenarios. So, for instance, instead of uh, corrupting a zero to a non-zero, what if we were corrupting some pointer that was accessing somewhere else in memory? Maybe uh, we need to be a bit more clever about how we uh, write those bytes, kind of like what I did with the saved return address, but maybe it's a pointer that then is accessed later and we need to corrupt this pointer to trigger some type of specific behavior. Another thing worth considering is taking advantage of the fact that null terminated strings or in C strings are null terminated, uh, which I demoed a little bit as far as, well, what's going on there? It turns out you could abuse that uh, to leak information uh, if you're clever about constructing your payloads. Uh, lastly, uh, you can use your padding bytes for further exploitation. Uh, if we look at what I was doing in IPython, I was still sending a whole bunch of A's. I sent 216 A's. This doesn't have to be A's. This could be a cyclic value. This could hypothetically be some shell code. This could be anything that we want. So anytime that you have the ability to insert data into a program is an opportunity for dual use. And so those padding bytes, those A's don't have to be A's. Those could be values that have other significance. Maybe they need to pass some type of check. Maybe they're used by the program and A doesn't make sense in the context the program is using that, right? And so our padding bytes may not be just A, all right? You could use it for further exploitation or maybe it has to be something in order to satisfy a constraint. When you're dealing with these more complicated scenarios, the single best tool to understand what happened is 100% going to be using GDB, debugging your program, printing out memory, and looking at what is actually occurring at runtime. Using a static tool like IDA will tell you what the assembly is doing and what the program hopefully kind of looks like. But when we're talking about memory corruption, we want to look at memory. You can only look at memory with a debugger. And the best debugger uh, for our use is going to be GDB. Uh, so when we are trying to inspect and reason about memory, GDB is kind of the Swiss army knife because we can ask any question we want about memory and there is a way in GDB to inspect it, to automate it, to print it out, to understand what is happening. And so with that, uh, we'll wrap this up. Uh, but hopefully this was a, a good kind of demo of different tools, techniques, how we can tie this all together uh, to start corrupting memory in a programmatic, automated fashion. Uh, with that, I'll leave you. Goodbye and good luck.